So, Marius, at last I find you. Terio, yes. Yes, now, now I recognize you of you. I should have known you'd travel in the skies. There, they're always watching. I've been searching for you for a long time, Marius. I was rather beginning to think you didn't want to be found. Oh, forgive me, Tyrion, please. It, it wasn't my fault. Not your fault? Tell me, Marius, how was it not your fault? The Wanderer. Yes, it was, it was the Wanderer. My days in the Rogue Citadel seemed so long ago. I sought refuge from my memories in the company of other outcasts high in the mountains past the Eastern Gate. When I dreamt, the memories would return. Memories of the monastery and the evil which it claimed dreams, memories. I couldn't tell the difference anymore. Could he found me here? How could this broken shell of a man, barely able to carry the weight of his own sword, be the burning terror which drove me to hide here? have demons of his own he struggled to contain <laughs> convinced that I was truly mad. The terror, the destruction, the, the evil I witnessed. How else could I explain them? Were these the demons from my dream or were they born within the wonder?
I did not follow him. I don't know. Why do things happen as they do in dreams? All I know is that when he beckoned, I had to follow him. And from that moment, we traveled together east. Always into the east. The enigmatic necromancers hold a belief that all creation exists in a delicate balance between light and darkness. Should either side gain control, all of Sanctuary would fall into ruin. As a member of their ancient order, one particular priest, Zul, fights to preserve that balance. Sent by his order from the southern swamps to pursue a new threat to Sanctuary, a shadowy figure rumored as last seen near Eastgate Monastery, leaving destruction in their wake. Zul's pursuit finds him at the rogue encampment, gathered with a group of heroes looking to remove the blight that has marred the once pristine land. We first gather our bearings by the bonfire in the center of the disheveled camp's flimsy protective wrappings, in which we sense death and anguish thick in the air. Loitering by the fire is our contact, garbed in blue trappings familiar to the desert dwellers of the east. No oh, greetings, stranger. I'm not surprised to see your kind here. Many adventurers have traveled this way since the recent troubles began. No doubt you've heard about the tragedy that befell the town of Tristram. Well, some say that Diablo, the Lord of Terror, walks the world again. I don't know if I believe that, but a dark wanderer did travel this route a few weeks ago. He was headed east to the mountain pass guarded by the rogue monastery. Maybe it's nothing, but evil seems to have trailed in his wake. You see, shortly after the Wanderer went through, the monastery's gates to the pass were closed, and strange creatures began ravaging the countryside. Until it's safer outside the camp and the gates are reopened, I'll remain here with my caravan. I hope to leave for Lutgulain before the shadow that fell over Tristram consumes us all. If you're still alive then, I'll take you along. You should talk to Akara, too. She seems to be the leader of this camp. Maybe she can tell you more. Heeding the traveler's prompt, we find ourselves headed to the southeastern corner of the camp. There, a purple-dressed pythoness paces in front of her tent's potions and wares. I am Akara, High Priestess of the Sisterhood of the Sightless Eye. I welcome you, traveler, to our camp, but I'm afraid I can offer you but poor shelter within these rickety walls. You see, our ancient sisterhood has fallen under a strange curse. The mighty citadel, from which we have guarded the gates to the east for generations, has been corrupted by the evil demoness Andariel. I still can't believe it, but she turned many of our sister rogues against us and drove us from our ancestral home. Now the last defenders of the Sisterhood are either dead or scattered throughout the wilderness. I implore you, stranger, please help us. Find a way to lift this terrible curse, and we will pledge our loyalty to you for all time. There is a place of great evil in the wilderness. Kasha's rogue scouts have informed me that a cave nearby is filled with shadowy creatures and horrors from beyond the grave. I fear that these creatures are massing for an attack against our encampment. If you are sincere about helping us, find the Dark Labyrinth and destroy the foul beasts. May the Great Eye watch over you. Ah. So the Maiden of Anguish herself has taken hold of the gates to the east, leveraging a nearby cave as a staging point and poised to strike from the shadows. From the looks of the remaining rogues, this will be their last stand. 
determined to deter the demons, we seek the battle-hardened Kasha, arms crossed against an impressive breast of full mail and scowl etched on her weary countenance. Welcome, Outlander, to our glorious hovel. I know you're here to challenge the evil that's driven us from our ancestral home. But know this, Akara may be our spiritual leader, but I command the rogues in battle. It will take more than just killing a few beasts in the wilderness to earn my trust. The demons in that cave have claimed many of my finest archers. I wonder how you will fare. Well now, fine fallen archers could be of some use if we are to fare any better. To the camp's northeast is a blacksmith's workshop. A muscle-bound woman hammers the iron with skill and precision. Hi there, I'm Charcy. The blacksmith here in camp. It's good to see some strong adventurers around here. Many of our sisters fought bravely against Diablo when he first attacked the town of Tristram. They came back to us true veterans, bearing some really powerful items. Seems like their victory was short-lived though. Most of them are now corrupted by Andario. The beasts from the cave have begun to roam throughout the countryside. You'd better be careful out there. This den has spawned the evil? Interesting. Lastly, we come to a wagon on the northwestern wall. There lingers a grubby, well-fed merchant type who looks quite dismayed at our arrival. A necromancer? I hoped I'd never have to lay my eyes on one of your kind again. The recent troubles in this area have brought out all kinds, I see. Nevertheless, your money's good. A spare weapon, some gold, a small gem is all I want in exchange for the equipment you'll need on whatever quest you might undertake. No, 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 don't be shy. All of my items are guaranteed for life and come with a two-day warranty. You're a brave soul. I'd sooner thrust my sacred scepter into the foulest carbuncular troll than set one boot into that cave. Fear not, Geet. All two inches of the sacred scepter is safe. But from the looks of how he hitches, maybe lay off the carbuncular trolls and invest in a salve for your skin. For going the relative safety of the encampment and entering the blood moor for the first time, we whisper a warning to the demonic denizens therein. All who oppose me, beware. The dreary moor's inhabitants meander just north of the camp, afflicted by a malignant malaise, as if hesitant to attack at the behest of their malevolent matriarch. Mm. No use letting this flesh go to waste, as we fell a few fresh victims in our ever-growing army of the undead. Where is the wretched hive? Just a stone's throw to the north is an entrance to the cave. A single body of a sun-bleached skeleton wards off the unwary, and the entrance itself adorned with a messy mural comprised of crude symbology depicting a gathering, no doubt created as a signpost for the monster's meeting place. Stepping inside, we declare. I sense death within this place. The den's dank walls dance with a reddish hue, as if hell was pushing its way in from the darkened stone. Delving deeper into the cave, a score of fallen amassing for their attack. The fallen are the first demonic creatures encountered, and appear as small demons carrying a spiked club, short scimitar-like sword or axe in one hand, and often a crude and metallic shield or torch in the other. They often scatter and run if one of their own is slain, but return to the fight again if stopped by any obstacle. Fallen Shaman, if in proximity, can casually resurrect slain Fallen, making the encounter maddening and teaching a very acute lesson on target prioritization. Ah! 
Gargantuan beasts are the weakest of all the Wendigo subspecies. Extremely territorial, these creatures attack anything that they see as a threat to their power, which is pretty much anything they encounter. Deep in the bowels of the den, we contend with a single errant zombie, and our skeletal minion rushes ahead into the gloom. It is easily dispatched by a gaggle of zombies, led by a super unique corpse fire, the bluest of their brethren. And we realize these are no ordinary zombies. Looking at the nearby tents and mining equipment, they must have been original inhabitants of this mining cave and overwhelmed by Andariel's forces. Aghast at this revelation, we portal back to town before we proceed. Hearing the news, Warif sympathizes. One who hesitates does so with good reason. Kasha simply prompts. You'd better come through on this. Your reputation depends on it. Chazi then checks. You haven't cleared the cave yet? Do you need anything? And of course, Geed attempts a quick upsell. Demons still be fouling that cave, huh? Huh. <laughs> I think you might need a new weapon. And finally, our quest giver, Akara, simply confirms. Your task is not complete until you have killed all the demons in that cave. Back inside the den, skeletal servants knew we learned a lesson of Corpse Fire's crew overwhelming our previous minion, this time fighting side by side, clubbing the gelatinous ghouls back to their graves. Corpse Fire proves more powerful, cursed with a spectral hit. Yet, eventually succumbs to the onslaught, leaving us to contend with his cadre one by one. On his body, we find various loot items as well as, what's this? A sacred scepter? Ooh, Geed's going to be jealous of its size and girth. We then systematically scrub out every last zombie and fallen's kin, leaving not a single demon alive at the behest of Akara's ardent appeal. And as the cave finally clears, we ask, Is that enough to earn the rogue's trust? Back at the camp, we see a welcoming Warif who inspires. <laughs> that which does not kill you makes you stronger. As a necromancer, we wholeheartedly concur. Hmm, I'm surprised you survived that test, Outlander. Go see Akara. She may reward you. That was a test? Interesting. The only good demon is a dead one, I say. By the way, did you happen to find... Anything in that cave you'd like to sell? Well, Gate, my scepter's bigger. You are truly brave and skillful. Akara was worried about you. Fear not, young one. Death has better things to do. And finally, task completed, we seek out Akara, who adulates. You have cleansed the den of evil. You've earned my trust, and may yet restore my faith in humanity. Your reward is training in the skill of your choice. With the den now cleared, we are one step closer to gaining the rogue's full trust and to quell Andariel's advances against the rogues. Death has done nothing to weaken Bloodraven's combat skills. If anything, she's more deadly than ever. Upon our return to the rogue encampment, with the demons dwelling in the den of evil utterly destroyed, the field captain Kasha reports. My rogue scouts have just reported an abomination in the monastery graveyard. Apparently, Andariel is not content to take only our living. Bloodraven, one of our finest captains in the battle against Diablo at Tristram, was also one of the first to be corrupted by Andariel. Now you'll find her in the monastery graveyard, raising our dead as zombies. We cannot abide this defilement. If you are truly our ally, you will help us destroy her. And Dariel's newest pawn is raising the dead. We don't take too kindly to competition. Searching for insight into this former hero's past, the witch Akara then illuminates. Blood Raven fought valiantly against Diablo in the catacombs beneath Tristram. She was never quite the same afterwards. It is now obvious that she brought an evil influence back with her. 
Such is the corruptive power of a prime. Seeing our puzzled expression, Warif, the caravan master, then poses. Hmm. How can one kill what is already dead? Clearly, Warif has never seen the majesty of a freshly fallen corpse explode and fragment into their nearby kin. The muscle-bound blacksmith, Chazi, then reiterates. Blood Raven was the leader of a rogue band that once fought Diablo at Tristram. And now, this Blood Raven is but a pawn of evil. And finally, we seek out the merchant Geed. I'm sorry, the undead are bad for trade. I have a strict no-return policy. Funny, we put all our dead on layaway. Checking our journal, we see Kasha has pointed us to the burial grounds adjacent to the Cold Plains. Our quest has taken us once more out of the confines of the encampment and into the Blood Moor. Following a path to the northwest, we batter and curse our enemies with amplified damage. This deceptively potent curse rapidly advances the age and putridity of any wound. Ordinary blows will cut through flesh and carve particularly vicious wounds that fester and seethe, naturally increasing the amount of damage received. Guarding the entrance to the Cold Plains, a lone figure, Flavi, warns. Beware. Beyond lies mortal danger for the likes of you. This is, no doubt, due to a new enemy, the Corrupted Rogues. Once members of the Proud Sisterhood, these undead are covered in fleshy tendrils, consumed by a dark hunger, and but puppets of the Maiden of Anguish and Dario. The Tainted Sisters are seldom caught alone, preferring to attack in groups. Many of the Corrupted Ones are said to have forgotten their skills with ranged weapons, or are so driven by Hell's Rage that they blindly melee with whatever weapon is at hand. As night falls upon a midnight dreary, we leave the cold plains, battered, weak and weary. In demon's stead, we find a pack of hungry dead, and upon dispatching them, it's then we said, Too many empty graves. Entering the burial grounds, our mission is clear to kill Blood Raven. Greeting us are uh, more undead, guarding the eastern gate of the decrepit graveyard. <laughs> Stepping over a broken cast iron fencing, we see a well-lit mausoleum, but then hear the dead are not at all at rest. Shambling in the center of the cemetery is a gaggle of undead. My army will destroy you. And there's Shepard, Blood Raven, in tow as she pelts us with poisoned arrows. We see, decorating the tree she stands beside, are a collection of fellow rogues' corpses hanging. Blood Raven herself, almost identical to her tainted sisters, save a demonic raven skull like helm, and she still proudly slings arrows in death as she did in life. <sighs> We attempt to circle the pack of fallen fiends to no avail. Attacking them head on leaves us exposed to more arrows lobbed at us ever so casually by an unfazed raven. Breaking from the pack, we attack Blood Raven head on, but once more, her formidable poison bites through our defenses and we're forced to dive into the nearby mausoleum to collect ourselves. The quiet crypt, a sanctuary we're all too familiar with, gives us a moment to cast the town portal and replenish our supplies, as Akara warns. If you fail to destroy Blood Raven, I fear that our order will perish forever. Jazzy then expands. Akara felt something was wrong even before Andario descended upon us. She feared that Blood Raven had stumbled upon some evil force beneath Tristram. I wish we had acted then. Geed then wonders aloud. I wonder if that old gossip Melra is among the undead. Oh, she had dirt on everybody. Worried then worries. When the dead return to prey upon the living, it is a terror beyond understanding. And finally, Kasha urges. Each moment you delay adds another undead sister to Blood Raven's army. She's right. Blood Raven's undead horde grows by the second. Portaling back to the mausoleum, we ready ourselves for the onslaught above. Our minds blank, save for one thought. 
I would kill. My army will destroy you. This time, a skeleton summon draws the attention of the undead mob, and we breach the gap between us and the raven and the slippery sister, cursing her with amplified damage, withering her own defenses, and attack with pure blunt force trauma, all the while retreating and healing as we kite her minions, using their slow shamble to our advantage. Simultaneously, dodging arrows and drawing out the rogue away from the pack, until finally we sense the hour of her doom is nigh, shrugging off the undead's assault as they impotently pour at us, and with a final blow, we shatter her skull, and a demonic essence lifts as we scoff. Blood Raven, rest well. And the raven's eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight over her streaming throws a shadow on the floor, and a soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. We approach Blood Raven's lifeless body. We find Fallen, a small hand axe, Plague Mangler, boasting superior amplified damage, as well as formidable elemental damage to boot. It's then, thanks to our necromantic ability, we touch the deceased corpse of Blood Raven and peer into her past, seeing she was once known as Morena, a powerful warrior as the rogues foretold, and a crucial member of the Triumvirate that miraculously felled Diablo neath the Cathedral of Tristram, a taint in which she carried with her, a madness to which she succumbed. Something to look forward to in our future, no doubt. With that, the dark deed done, we arrive back at the encampment, and Akara says, Andariel must be made to pay for her sacrilege. Tensions will remain high until Andariel is dealt with. Kasha wishes to reward you for your defeat of Blood Raven. I thank you too, even though Blood Raven was once my friend. We mourn the loss of a rogue, yet no, the Morena they once counted as an ally is long gone. Some of those gals weren't so nice the first time around. Keed, not being a hit with the ladies, truly a shocking revelation. Next time, warn us so we can be seated. You've done well, stranger. I hope all your efforts are worth it. Me too, War Eve. Uh, me too. And finally, we seek out Kasha for our reward. I can hardly believe that you've defeated Bloodraven. Though she was once my closest friend, I pray that her tortured spirit remains banished forever. You have earned my respect, stranger, and the allegiance of the rogues. I have placed several of my best warriors at your disposal. Now, with one of Kasha's finest at our side, our quest has ended. But a hunt for Andariel, we fear, has just begun. Tristram is too far to journey by foot. Cain would likely be dead when you arrived. However, there is a magical portal that will take you there instantly. To open it, one must stand within the circle of Cairn stones and touch them in a certain order. The proper order can be found in the runes written on the bark of the Tree of Inifus. You must find the sacred Tree of Inifus and bring back its bark. I will translate the runes to unlock the stone's mystic pattern. Returning to camp, with the blood of a certain raven still fresh on our beak, the witch Akara beckons to us once more to bark orders anew. It is clear that we are facing an evil difficult to comprehend, let alone combat. There is only one Haradrim sage, schooled in the most arcane history and lore, who could advise us. His name is Deckard Cain. You must go to Tristram and find him, my friend. I pray that he still lives. The Haradric scholar Deckard Cain lives. We'd heard he'd gone quite mad. The battle-hungry Captain Kasha then schemes. The Bark of Inifus holds mystical runes. Akara can translate them into our revenge. You could say I'm intrigued. Worive, the caravana elucidates. Months ago, I came across a few survivors from Tristram. 
They said that Cain had gone half mad and could no longer distinguish fact from fantasy. A man that cannot distinguish fact from fantasy. Sounds like Geed. Jazzy, the blacksmith, then explains. If you bring back the Bark of Enifus, Akara will tell you how to get to Tristram. And before we search for this underground passage to the Dark Woods, we stop briefly at Geed the portly merchant's camp, to which he confesses. I would sooner micturate in a tankard of my own ale than journey to Tristram. Totally unnecessary, Geed, my friend. I already did it for you. With our quest clear, led by Kasha's scout Habaya, we make haste to the cold plains to search for the stony field in which we're told the underground passage lies. There, we're met by a force of dark hunters and a batch of gargantuan beasts, led by the extra strong Wind Shank, the Sharp. Thank you. Barely victorious, we decide to discard our now feeble wand for close quarter combat and make use of our necromantic knowledge to poison a dagger on our person. The apothecary skills of the necromancer lay fundamentally in the studies of venoms, toxins, and other poisonous substances. Not only can a skilled necromancer identify the various strains of poison that he might come across, but he also maintains a ready supply of samples. Rarely does he shy from their use. In a common application of this skill, the necromancer paints his dagger with a thin coat of virulent poison. The greater his ability, the more potent the poison. Entering the stony field, we happen upon a gruesome vestige of what appears to be a fleshy tree. A fresh dose of poisoning reveals its inhabitants. Spawned from the nests that have infested the wilderness, these winged monsters known as foul crows assail passers-by with quick swooping attacks. Contending with the carrion carriers, we find we're but a stone's throw from a waypoint to the stony field, and to the northwest, the promised underground passage, burrowed into the side of the cliff. Inside said passage, we're immediately waylaid by the sickly, vile hunters and are forced to defend ourselves. Sisters to the Dark Hunters, these vile vixens have clearly succumbed further to demonic possession with their unholy visage. Lurking nearby are the scaly misshapen, led by the fire-enchanted Haze Fester. These malformed demons gain their strength and resilience from the natural element of lightning. While slow afoot, these beasts deliver a palpable hit when engaged at close range and can absorb a fair amount of damage. Tainted are perhaps an even greater threat when wounded, however, as this is when they retreat and direct their orbs of lightning at their enemies. While contending with a fresh batch of vile hunters, our attention momentarily forfeit as our guide, Abhaya, pays for our lapse of concentration and is killed by a quartet of skeleton archers. A costly mistake. We know skeletons do not consume the flesh of the living as many of their other undead kindred, but seek only to slay those who live to increase their ranks. Single-minded in their mission to slay the living, some of these animated warriors use the bows that served them in life to deadly effect. Archers let their brethren rush forward while they hang back and fire into the melee. And we played right into their bony bows. Persevering unguided through the caves, the malicious inhabitants impart to us a rare gift, a preserved head, only usable by the necromancer. It adds a boon to poison, raised skeleton, and amplified damage abilities. Also of note, the coveted Bone Armor Spell of Defense. This spell summons a barrier created from the bones of fallen warriors. 
The armor revolves around the necromancer, protecting him against all attacks. Although enchanted, the armor does take damage and will eventually crumble. After what seems like hours in the maze-like passage, we finally see a light at the end of the tunnel and exit to the dark wood. Surfacing to a gloomy forest, we're surrounded by vile hunters equipped with sharp blades and pointed purpose. Carvers close by crawl from a ruin, swarming, and our dagger begins to buckle under the strain of so many slain. As we retreat out of the fallen fenced fortress to the east, a pack of brutes attempt to smack us backwards, and we see what they are guarding, the coveted tree of Inifus. All of Hell's forces seem to converge due to our unwarranted trespassing, forcing our retreat back to the underground passage whence we came. There, we pick off an errant brute before ourselves, bounding through a town portal for much-needed repairs of our wares and insight into the ancient tree. How will you find Cain without going to Tristram? Finding the Tree of Inifus is the first step on your journey. The Tree of Inifus is hard to find, but you'll know it when you see it. Without the Bark of Inifus, you can't find Cain. He who seeks that which cannot be found must look inside himself for further guidance. Or look harder. Barking up the wrong tree, huh? You'll find it. Just keep looking. Once returned to the passage, we decide a skeleton is too flimsy for the brute's blows and take the precious time to summon a clay golem. While it is fairly simple for a necromancer to animate dead tish, it is another matter entirely to instill the spark of life into inanimate objects. The clay golem is the simplest form of this complex art, creating a servant directly from the earth to serve the necromancer. The intense strain this places on the psyche of the caster only allows him to maintain a single golem of any type at a time. Clearing the area near the tree, we then remark, This tree shines with inner spirits. This knobby protuberance gives us the promised scroll of Inifus that displays a strange pentagram puzzle, and we know we must return to Akara. Pausing briefly, we identify the armor dropped by Treehead as Ghoul Shroud, blessed with modest attributes, including Thorn's damage to attackers. Once back in the rogue encampment, the residents urge us to take the scroll to Akara for further examination. With this scroll, you may open a portal back to Tristram. Only Akara can decipher its logic. What can I do for you? Get this to Akara. Only she can understand it. Look, friend, I trade a lot of strange items, but I'm not gonna start dealing in bark, okay? This looks like gibberish to me. Akara may know what to make of it. Ah, very good. I have translated the runes on this scroll. You must find the cairn stones and touch them in the order that I have written. With the sequence marked, our mission is clear. Go to the cairn stones in the stony field. Touch the stones in the order found on the scroll of Inifus. Enter the portal to Tristram, but beware the danger that lies ahead. Back in the stony field, we find the Fallen guarding the Cairn Stones, led by their own lightning-enchanted demigod, Rakanishu, whose flesh, surprisingly, submits to our poison pitifully. His corpse gives a large yellow axe, Glyph Hue. Impressive attributes, if not for our newly found fondness of daggers. Approaching the can stones, we glance at Kara's instructions of the order in which to activate the pillars. Once completed, lightning rains down from above and births an ominous red portal. in which we have only one choice if we're to save Cain, and as such, hesitantly step inside. All that's left of proud Tristram are ghosts and ashes. 
encountering a rogue's corpse next to the portal, her body ripped asunder in what can only be described as unbound rage. Not even the cows were safe. The town is now overrun by demons, and we attempt to scout the outskirts of the dilapidated ruins, untethering the bound body of a dead rogue left to sear in the heat of hellfire. To the north, there are wagons blocking the exit of the town that leads to the infamous cathedral. West, along the river bank, the fallen swarm around a single body of a boy killed not long ago. Examining the boy's corpse and coming into contact with his wooden peg leg, our senses overwhelmed as we see his past as a young, mercantile rapscallion before, that is, the town fell. Psst, over here. The horror of the sheer destruction gives us pause and we portal back to town momentarily to glean any information we can about the horrors we're about to face. I have heard that Tristram is now in ruins. Without Cain, I fear for the ruin of all of us. I'm told that Tristram now resembles a meat hall after a barbarian wedding. I will wait here for your most glorious return. It is too dangerous to travel to Tristram. I won't be leaving here until the way is clear. Deckard Kane has crucial knowledge about the evils we face. You must find him. If he still lives, Deckard Kane may be in grave peril. You must hurry to Tristram before all is lost. Not liking Kane's odds, we dutifully return to Tristram for a final time. South of the river, we're again accosted by the fallen fiends, but an unfamiliar figure joins the fray. The stout blacksmith Griswold was once one of those who were bound past death to attend the desires of the three. Wandering the town he once loved, he uses arcane powers and unholy strength granted to his twisted body by Andariel to stop any from following the path of the Wanderer, sinking our poisoned dagger into his undead heart. Granting Griswold rest once more, we look into his past and can almost hear his greeting in a hearty brogue. Well, what can I do for you? To the south is a sun-bleached corpse splayed across a rock whose body had passed many moons ago. Handling his drinking flask, we see the past memories of a befuddled man whose name was Farnham, drowning his sorrows in a perpetual stupor. Turn a fellow drinking peace? Crossing into the town square, we hear Deckard Kane's cries from the center of town. Help! and begin to clear the lingering enemies, and we see Cain himself locked in a gibbet with a front row seat to the carnage below. Freeing Cain, we exclaim. Deckard Cain, if you value your life, leave here immediately. As we move to see if there are any more survivors, we brush against his gibbet, and instead of seeing the past, we peer into something we have never glimpsed before, Cain's divergent future. There, we spy Cain in a desert land, and his fate if we had not saved him from the demons this day. Oh, oh blessings on the rogues. They finally rescued me from that cursed place. Back at town, we find two badly charred remains of bodies and not much else. The first out front of a tavern lies the torso of its obsequious owner, Ogden. Greetings, good master. Welcome to the Tavern of the Rising Sun. And to the southwest, a clinician's corpse who was once a healer named Pepin. His body and perhaps soul ravaged by demons beyond any repair. What ails you, my friend? Finally, we pause by the well in the center of town and take one last look at Tristram, bodies piled of dead rogues, and peer into the past to see the horrors at the hands of the Dark Wanderer, bringing death and destruction. Fuck you bastards! Born dead! And we can't help but wonder, is this our fate? If we follow his path, but does one truly have a choice? One can only match, move by move, the machinations of fate, and thus defy 
the tyrannous stars. Returning to camp, the inhabitants all point us to Akara for our reward. Again you amaze me, Outlander. The Sisterhood is grateful to you for delivering Cain to us. I believe Akara has something to tell you. Only a brave adventurer could return with Deckard Cain. Akara has a reward for your valor. Akara wishes to reward you for your bravery in returning Deckard Cain. Ah, Cain is here. <laughs> Another customer. I haven't been this pleased since a love-starved maiden let down a bit more than her hair. Greetings. You have risked your life to rescue Cain. For that, we thank you. We must seek his counsel immediately. And finally, we speak to Cain, who bears grave news about Tristram and our enemies ahead. As a token of my gratitude, I will identify items for you at no charge. Regrettably, I could do nothing to prevent the disaster which devastated Tristram. It would appear that our greatest fears have come to pass. Diablo, the Lord of Terror, has once again been set loose upon the world. As you know, some time ago Diablo was slain beneath Tristram, and when our hero emerged triumphant from the labyrinth beneath town, we held a grand celebration that lasted several days. Yet, as the weeks passed, our hero became increasingly aloof. He kept his distance from the rest of the townsfolk, and seemed to lapse into a dark, brooding depression. I thought that perhaps his ordeal had been so disturbing that he simply could not put it out of his mind. The hero seemed more tormented every passing day. I remember he awoke many times, screaming in the night, always something about the East. One day he simply left, and shortly thereafter Tristram was attacked by legions of foul demons. Many were slain, and the demons left me to die in that cursed cage. I believe now that Tristram's hero was that dark wanderer who passed this way before the monastery fell. I fear even worse, my friend. I fear that Diablo has taken possession of the hero who sought to slay him. If true, Diablo will become more powerful than ever before. You must stop him or all will be lost. While exploring the stony field, we happen upon a curiosity. A moldy tome lies in the center of the ruins of a long forgotten tower. We cannot help but pause to peruse its putrid pages. And so it came to pass that the Countess, who once bathed in the rejuvenating blood of a hundred virgins, was buried alive and her castle, in which so many cruel deeds took place, fell rapidly into ruin. Rising over the buried dungeons in that godforsaken wilderness, a solitary tower, like some monument to evil, is all that remains. The Countess's fortune was believed to be divided among the clergy, although some say that more remains unfound, still buried alongside the rotting skulls that bear mute witness to the inhumanity of the human creature. A bloody countess? Surely the rogues would know more of this fiend which the book locates in the Black Marsh. Tucking the tome under arm, we portal back to town in which Deckard Cain explains. That tower marks a place of danger. There is an epic poem about it. How much sorrow one can stand was tested there. Any poem with a hundred virgins sacrificed is indeed epic, but this is not the blood magic we learned in the necropolis. We then seek the wisdom of the witch Akara, who warns. The dangers there are not solely architectural. Once inside that wretched place, many succumb to a vile miasma. Something tells us, with enough blood, this Countess is perhaps a drain on even the very foundations of the tower itself. Kasha, the battle master, then reveals. The tome speaks of treasure, yet all we have found are death, delirium, and disappointment. 
Ah, treasure. With a lack of virgins, this countess must need a new bait to lure in fresh victims to indulge her bloodlust. Charzi, the blacksmith, then remembers. That old tower is as rotten on the inside as it appears on the outside. I heard that several sisters came to a gruesome end when a stairwell collapsed on them. No doubt more bodies to fill out the Countess's ranks. Geed, the greedy merchant, then shows surprising insight. <laughs> the only wealth you're likely to find there is a wealth of vermin. I guess Geed is filthy. All the virgins are gone. Warith, the caravan master, then apprises. Rumors of treasure are no different from rumors of any other kind. They hold false promise to those who should know better. And yet, although we do know better, we still feel compelled to learn of this Countess's practice of dark blood magic. Exiting the relative safety of the rogue encampment, we begin our search for the Countess, said to be located in the Black Marsh beyond the Dark Wood. It is not long before we find, guarding the marsh's entrance, unsurprisingly, is a gaggle of spear-brandishing vile lances, led by the somewhat dubiously named Foul Poison. As she is indeed a vile creature, yet she seems to be cursed with a nasty lightning enchant instead. Trudging through the miasmic marsh, we pick off Eren's vile archers, once esteemed sisters of the sightless eye, and they lead us to the monolithic tower of the bloody Countess, looming in the center of the morass. The decrepit tower appears to be heavily dilapidated, only boasting a single remaining floor. However, inside lies a ladder leading into its bowels below. Upon entry, we remark, this place reeks of death. Inside the basement, the air is heavy with a malevolent mist that hangs about our ankles. Our only way forward is a crack in the western corner that leads to some form of cellar. Inspecting the entrance, we see the mist, momentarily abated, had hidden puddles of blood and bone underfoot. Inside the cellar, the blood is ever more pronounced. And oddly, the symbology of the Zacharum church on display. This countess must have once been an adherent, or perhaps seduced by a darker power. In response to our trespassing, ghosts begin to flood into the crypt. These wraiths are ethereal, physical manifestations of tortured souls from the plains of the burning hells. They materialize to attack as skeletal, bat-winged creatures, ringed by an aura of eldritch energy. Energy. It's only at the tower's fifth and final floor of the cellar are we peppered by freezing arrows of vile archers. Unable to conjure a defense, we still have but one directive, to dispose of the evil countess. And so, we summon a town portal to gather sorely needed potions of Thor and advice to boot. Quickly in and quickly out is all the advice I can give you. Have you suddenly lost your taste for wealth? There is no more I can tell you about that ancient tower. You're not ready to give up, are you? Guess what? I've named a boil on my ass after you. It too bothers me every time I sit down. Your presence honors me. Better an empty pocket than a full grave. Potions in hand and bone armor anew, we make our final gambit against the ghastly Dark Archers. <laughs> Retreating into an eastern room, we find promised treasure is strewn haphazardly about, as if the occupants care little for the bounty. However, the Blood Clan Goatmen come to defend the loot all the same, slaughtering the misshapen Khazra in a great hall lined with torches that leads to a literal bloodbath swirling with precious crimson liquid of the poor virgins, showing that the Countess has hopped out of the tub and is no doubt nearby. Searching the eastern arm of the altar, a dark stalker meets us in the doorway that bursts into hellfire. A chilling voice promises, Your blood will boil. 
With the minions all but destroyed, we step through the blaze and face the fire-enchanted Countess in all her bloody glory. Only when their attention is drawn do we sink our dagger into her black heart from behind. As the Countess spirit abates, treasure bursts across the room. And we find the Tal and Ral runes, as well as a unique poison resistant quilted armor. Pausing momentarily, we see the pentagram etched with blood neath our feet on the floor. Touching it reveals the bloody Countess's spirit has not fully been destroyed this day. Beauty fades. It is impossible to escape. I will not submit to this truth. I am beyond the pitiful laws of tiny men. Their blood will serve me. Fulfill my purpose. My splendor. Reborn from their pain. And my beauty will never fade again. With Bounty in hand, we head back to town and are greeted by its inhabitants at the news that the tower is finally cleared. Well done, my friend. Courage and opportunity together have created in you a kind of alchemy. Your rewards are well earned. To us, the tower was nothing more than a headstone looming over a long-forgotten grave. I thought the stories of treasure in the tower were nothing but lies. I am glad you found something of value in that death trap. Would that our sisters had been so fortunate. Those riches will serve you well on the long road ahead. Warreve's advice is like corpse gas. It befouls the air for a moment, and then it disappears. Remember, wealth is as insubstantial as a cloud and passes as quickly. Ignore Geed. All that twitters is not bold. All that twitters is not bold. Truer words have never been spoke. The monastery can confuse even those who know it well. Stay alert in there. Upon returning to the rogue encampment, post disposing of the bloody Countess, Jazzy, the blacksmith, approaches us with a request. When I fled the monastery, I left behind the Herodric Malice, my enchanted smithing hammer. If you can retrieve it for me, I'll use its magic to strengthen your equipment. This malice would be a great boon to our war waged against the burning hells. However, as the monastery is overrun, it's no wonder the malice lays unclaimed. Remarkably, even the greasy merchant Geed is crumbling under Charzi's incessant requests. Charzi talks of nothing anymore but this Herodric malice. Between you and her, my ears need a rest. Just find it and bring it back quickly. Poor Geed. The malice, no doubt bearing a storied history, it's then we seek the wisdom of the last known Herodric scholar, Deckard Cain. The malice was forged and enchanted by the ancient Herodric mages during the Sin Wars. When their union dissolved, the malice was entrusted to the Sisterhood, guarding the pass into the east. And now, thanks to Andariel, the monastery lies in ruins. The caravan of Wariv then instructs. Just as an archer needs bow and arrow, or a draftsman pen and paper, so Charcy needs the Horadric Malice with which to ply her trade. Indeed, Charcy's situation is less than ideal. A sentiment shared by Kasha, the battle captain, who regales. Charcy is wasting her time and talents using an inferior hammer. Had she the Herodric malice, she could make the steel sing and craft you a suit of armor as impenetrable as the Great Eye. The Great Eye she speaks of seems to have looked into the abyss and unfortunately blinked. Akara, the witch, then further warns. The retrieval of the Herodric malice is not without risk. Our monastery is filled with voracious hellspawn. You'd best be careful, my friend. More cause for concern is we've been instructed to search for the malice in the monastery barracks, yet no one has mentioned the rumored demonic smith in possession of the enchanted hammer. 
Entering the Tamo Highlands, we are waylaid by a new enemy, the Returned Mage. These animated skeletal remains of slain sorcerers wield the forces of elemental magic as they sow death throughout the land. It's not long before we finally arrive at the once hallowed halls of the Monastery Gate. Dark stalkers burst forth to protect their unholy haven, the symbol of the sightless eye. Ever watchful as we cautiously enter, the halls themselves are smattered with blood of the fallen, and we use our necromantic ability to peer into the dead's bloody past and are overwhelmed by the sheer evil that was wrought in the wake of the Dark Wanderer. We're forced then to fight our way through the outer cloister of the citadel. All manner of demon from yetis to devil kin, hellbent on thwarting our progress into the coveted barracks. Behind large wooden doors lies the barracks interior. Death Clan Khazra march out of the gloom, spiked clubs and halberds in grubby paws. Their brethren amass in the dark reaches of the barracks wine cellar, barely visible save the torches of the devil kin. Like angry townsfolk looking to make an example of an errant trespasser. Blindly probing around the blackened barracks, we carelessly step towards the dim light of a room filled with a dozen demons and skeletons. Out of the soft, inviting glow of a crimson fire pit, boldly strides the smith, a hulking overlord demon, his flesh a bluish hue, still garbed in his smithing apron and hammer in hand. Our clay golem tries in vain to fend off his swings, but is casually crushed, to which the smith taunts. I shall make weapons from your bones! Our defenses now decimated, we retreat back to town for resupply, and quite frankly, reasons to push on. It's there, Cain explains. Hmm, the malice has eluded you so far. Well, search thoroughly in the barracks. That is where the rogues kept their forge. Kasha then reminds. To do battle with Andariel requires more than thick skin and a strong will. You'll want armor and weaponry forged with the hammer's enchantments. She's right. Armor and weaponry's needed. Taking Kasha's advice, we reluctantly hire a second scout, Amplissa, with a cold enchanted bow to slow the beast, as we'll need as many distractions for this smith as possible. Akara then questions. If you can't carry out this quest, how will you face the greater evils ahead? Jazzy, please. Malice is a heraldic artifact of great power. Please bring it back. Geed jests. Yes? I've heard that you bear us no malice. <laughs> and War Eve. Well, wordplay is the word of the day. Well, <laughs> what better opportunity to show your metal? Our supplies renewed, as is our metal. We step back into the barracks, with our new companion luring out the smith's enemies as he desperately guards his forge, the prized malice on a nearby stand. And Pliss's cold arrows peppered the smith's already blue hide, until he finally succumbs to our assault. <laughs> On his corpse, we find an impressive yellow hunter's bow, Viper Bolt. More importantly, the Roderick Malice sits on its stand, basking in the amber glow of the smith's fire, no longer in the servitude of Hell's haughty hands. Returning to town, the inhabitants praise. The magical effects imbued by the Malice are impossible to predict, but are always to the good. Now that the Herodric Malice is back in our possession, we shall use it to deliver a great blow against the evil which torments this land. Well done, my friend. But remember, the return of the Herodric Malice 
is but one step in reclaiming the monastery. I am glad the hammer has returned, and you with it. I guess it's too late to take back some of the names I called you. Waiting dutifully by her forge is Charcy the blacksmith, who exclaims, Greetings. Oh, thanks so much for returning the Herodric Malice. I will now imbue one of your items with magical powers. Taking up Charcy on her offer, due to her newfound hammer, we gift her a batch of superior daggers to which she imbues with poisonous properties and names Raven's Hue, no doubt in memory of her fallen friend, Blood Raven. These poison enchanted knives will hopefully help hew a limb or two of the Maiden of Anguish and Dariel herself. Diablo is heading east for some foul purpose, and the only passage east is through the monastery gate. Obviously, Diablo summoned Andariel to block any pursuit. For her part, Andariel hopes to win Diablo's favor. The lesser demons are always vying for positions of power within the unholy hierarchy. Post disposing of the demonic smith in the monastery barracks. All this for a hammer? We're stopped by Deckard Kane, Hello. who reveals the confrontation with the lesser evil Andariel is all but upon us. It is certain that we face the demon queen Andariel, who has corrupted the rogue sisterhood and defiled their ancestral monastery. This does not bode well for us, my friend. Ancient Horodric texts record that Andariel and the other lesser evils once overthrew the three prime evils, Diablo, Mephisto, and Baal, banishing them from hell to our world. Here they caused mankind untold anguish and suffering before they were finally bound within the Soul Stones. And Doriel's presence here could mean that the forces of Hell are once again aligned behind Diablo and his brothers. If this is true, then I fear for us all. You must kill her before the monastery becomes a permanent outpost of Hell, and the way east lost forever. An outpost of Hell, and yet... Her anguish has not dampened the spirits of all of the camp's inhabitants as the Captain Kasha fumes. I can imagine a thousand different ways to kill Andariel. You need only choose one. We're going to need all the fury of the rogues to defeat the unholy maiden. Akara the Witch is of similar mind. Andariel has desecrated all we hold dear. She must not be permitted to serve Diablo. Destroy her. The corruption of our order must be undone. The perverse corruption pervades all. Jazzy, the blacksmith, commands of us. Send Andariel back to the hell she came from. The sisters are relishing the idea of slaughter. However, the male inhabitants of this camp seem less bloodthirsty, as Geet, the self-interested merchant, whimpers. You're going after Andariel? Uh, one of my wagon wheels is in need of repair. I'll be under the wagon, if I'm needed. We call to Geed under his wagon. That's wheel looks fine, but he remains steadfast in his appraisal. The map makers tell us the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Our way east is a line that runs through Andariel's stronghold, the monastery. And so our quest begins to hunt down Andariel, whose lair is said to be in the very depths of the monastery itself. Inside the smith's barracks, we search for a way into the inner cloister of the monastery. Our best bet is through the jail, its bars ripped open by a gargantuan, unseen force. Upon entry, we remark, Ah, the slow torture of caged starvation. Blood smatters the walls and floor, and yet, curiously, there are no bodies to accompany said gore. Dark magics permeate the already macabre jail's interior. Stumbling upon a waypoint, its blue flame illuminates its glyph etched in human blood, and piles of gore littered about. However, 
Perhaps most unsettling is the deafening silence. Surfacing from the bloody jail, we enter the inner cloister which leads to the Sisters Cathedral atop its catacombs. The large hall is lined with pews, a single rogue lay in the midst of the blood, and we see nearby a Zacharum altar defiled, giving an unholy sermon is the super unique Bone Ash, an undead burning mage with a wicked cold enchant that nearly welds our feet firmly to the floor. <laughs> Disposing of the bony bastard, nearby lie the catacombs which Andariel's rumored to occupy. A badly disfigured rogue wards off any foolish enough to have gotten this far. I sense. A demonic presence here. Well, most. Preternaturally, sensing Andariel's evil permeating from the very depths of the catacombs, it's on its fourth and final floor. We are certain of her presence, and our final directive is crystal clear. Kill Andariel. Inside a great hall, we're met by a score of fallen. Hell itself has spilled forth into our realm. Fire is littered about, engulfing burning bodies of fallen rogues. Tail-like bone structures whip through the foundations and rupture the floor amidst overwhelming amounts of blood. <laughs> Only after destroying the final fallen do we actually take in the amount of destruction that Andariel has wrought. The bodies we search for in the floors above have ended in a great pit carved in the earth with a dozen visible corpses bobbing in a crimson pool. The air thick with a copper scent and viscera strewn about in gruesome decorative fashion. Andariel is making herself at home. Knowing the magnitude of the evil we're about to face, we seek the wisdom of the townsfolk once more, perhaps for a final time, in which Kasha first urges. Deckard Kane has important information about Andariel. It is clear that Andariel is acting on behalf of Diablo to prevent anyone from following him eastward. Her defeat would allow you to continue the pursuit. Ancient lore has it that while Andariel was spawned in the burning hells, she is not fond of fire. You have done much to help us, but I sense that this has only fueled Andariel's fury. She will not stop until we are all dead. You must kill Andariel before her army can gain the upper hand. If you are the hero that you seem to be, now is the time to prove it. Have you stumbled upon that demon queen yet? I hear she's quite the beauty. <clears throat> as far as maidens of anguish go, that is. May I remind you that my caravan can only go east if the monastery is cleansed. We follow the trail of blood to the large double doors. Opening them begins an assault of misshapen lying in wait. Attempting to clear the room lest we're overwhelmed by the sheer demonic numbers, a mindless golem dutifully rushes ahead, catching us off guard. In response, massive plumes of poison waft in every direction. It's then we see the largest demon we've ever witnessed, and Dariel unleashes another few bouts of poison, which our companion Amplissa succumbs to quickly. We're forced to retreat, and the demoness stalks us down on cloven hoof while taunting. Fear me. Unable to endure the poison's caustic touch, we desperately summon more clay golems to keep Andariel at bay. In response, she casually crushes each of our servants before spewing forth more poison in an unending deluge of green clouds of death. And so then we remember Charzi's boon, Raven Hue, equipping our poison-laden throwing knives we attempt to leverage the demoness's own pit of death to our advantage as we kite her attempts to catch us, summoning clay golems that are still reduced to rubble, however, gives us precious time to pepper the succubus with a nasty prick crafted by a vengeful blacksmith's Herodric hammer. Remarkably, just as Andariel looms over us a final time, a venomous war of attrition comes to an end. The maiden 
momentarily distracted, looks to crush another golem, and her final blade finds its mark in her weakened back and punctures her putrid posterior. Back to the hell that spawned you, Andariel. Before returning to War Eve, now the path to the east is cleared. We find on the maiden powerful yellow boots, an axe and trident, and various other semi-precious gems. Before exiting the monastery, we clear the area, take a final look, seeing Andariel's bony throne, a remnant of a short rule. Back in town, we're met by a hesitantly optimistic Kane who warns. This is a great victory indeed, but many more battles await. I will accompany you on your journey, lending what assistance I can. Remember, Diablo is still out there, seeking something in the desert. I'm afraid that this nightmare will not end until you find what it is that he seeks. Kasha finally warms to us before bidding us adieu. And Dariel's death brings about renewed life for us all. We mourn the loss of our dear sisters, but at least now we can get on with our lives. I may have misjudged you, Outlander. You are a true hero and testament to the noble spirit which has inspired our order for generations. Farewell, my friend. The now jubilant Akara thanks. Finally we may rejoice. We owe you a debt we can never repay. I only hope that in time we will be able to rebuild our order. All our thanks go with you, my friend. Chazi seems like she will miss our presence. Greetings. You'll probably go east now. It was good to know you. I hope you'll come back if you ever need anything. Indeed, crawled from under his wagon, is now celebrating. <laughs> I'm gonna party like it's 9.99. And finally, with one somber last look at the encampment, we dutifully meet with Warif to travel east, as we expect a hunt for Diablo has just begun. The caravan is prepared. We may now journey eastward to loot Golane. We traveled east, over the mountains and into the vast deserts of broken lands. As the days passed, my companion told me of himself, that he had once been a great warrior, and that a dark and secret burden now weighed heavily upon him. We traveled for an eternity across that barren wasteland. How long? I couldn't say. And always, a dark cloud seemed to follow us just over the horizon. Finally, the journey ended. We climbed the last bridge. And there below us lay our destination. The shining jewel looped the lane with a great sea beyond. We made camp that last night. Perhaps it was the warm desert wind or the sound of the ocean, but for the first time in many weeks, I slept. However, the dreams returned, but these were clearly not my own. I beheld the vision of a great man, the mage Talrasha. You were there too, Tyrael. I remember seeing you in my dream. His brethren had cornered a great demon, Baal, Lord of Destruction, who had been set loose upon the world. And they attempted to imprison the demon within a sacred stone. Yet when their attempts failed, Talrasha selflessly volunteered to contain the demon within himself, completing the prison. He instructed 
tempted his brethren to bind him within the tomb, buried under the sand, there to wrestle with the demon for all eternity. set out with the dawn. The next morning, we walked over the hill toward Lutkulain. I had no idea then of the horrors that were in store for me there. <laughs> 